Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started on this second lecture in this new colloquium that is being jointly sponsored by the National Human Genome Research Institute and the American Society of Human Genetics, which we've called um, Journeys in Human Genetics and Genomics. Um, I hope you enjoyed last week's uh, lecture as much as I did, and um, I'm delighted to be here um, to give the second lecture. And since I'm also the host, I'm not going to introduce myself, but for all these lectures, we're asking the speakers to start off by giving a description of their career journey and their life in a little bit. And I've done this um, uh, before and enjoy doing it. And so I'm gonna tell you about myself uh, very visually though. So uh, my journey began in 1959 uh, when I was born in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, I'm instantly becoming a Cardinal fan and becoming um, a hometown uh, fan of the entire city of St. Louis. Um, admittedly, I was born in a science family um, that has influenced my life considerably. My father was a virologist, and so I grew up in a family where research was talked about um, quite commonly. I'd point out I was a very cute kid, I have to admit, um, and I had two older siblings. I was the youngest of three, um, and so I, I grew up um, sort of surrounded by uh, two siblings, actually, that for the purposes of disclosure, both of my older siblings went into medicine and science. So again, a very science uh, dominant family. Um, I had my uh, uh, rebellious phases, uh, such as an early teenager with long hair, which was, was uh, uh, very popular back then. Um, and I also, I, I was very um, slow and looking like I was gonna get old because this is my high school graduation photo where I looked like I was about 12 or 13. All right, so from there, I decided to leave St. Louis after going graduating high school, and I went northward where both of my siblings went, actually, as undergraduates, and I became an undergraduate at University of Wisconsin. I uh, was musically inclined, but not, not professionally, just for recreational purposes. I was a member of the marching band as I was in high school and enjoyed the sports culture of Wisconsin, but I was also a, a serious student. I was a microbiology major. But I also got involved in research starting very early on in my um, um, undergraduate years. And in fact, uh, my senior year, I actually won an undergraduate uh, research award for all the work I had done as an undergraduate. It then came time to move on to um, what I was going to do after I graduated. And I decided to pursue a joint MD-PhD degree. And the best program I thought that I got into was just back in my hometown. So I returned to St. Louis. Um, where I was an MD-PhD student uh, completing the program in six years. I would also uh, point out that will be relevant to knowing a little bit about me is as a graduate student, I actually had two PhD mentors. I deliberately wanted to be co-mentored and I didn't do anything related to DNA or genetics or really anything in molecular biology. Uh, rather, I worked on um, sugar molecules that are attached to glycoproteins. I, would consider, I got a PhD in cell biology. I really did um, sugar biochemistry was mostly what I did as a graduate student. Um, and then in 1987, I graduated. And uh, due to um, uh, circumstances with my uh, then wife, um, needed to stay in St. Louis for postgraduate training. And so I decided to do a very light residency of not even just pathology, but just half of pathology. So I became a health physician, as they're called, in laboratory medicine or clinical pathology, which is the half of pathology that runs diagnostic laboratories, so not surgical pathology or anatomic pathology. And what that did was overwhelmingly created an opportunity for me to quickly jump back in the lab about 14 months after I graduated with my MD-PhD degree. And I chose to shift away from what I had done as a graduate student, away from what I had done as an undergraduate, and to work in a lab that was doing some really cool things that were related to analyzing big pieces of DNA. And all this was a lead in to my involvement in genomics. Um, I worked in the laboratory of Maynard Olson as a postdoctoral fellow, and what that set me up for, because Maynard Olson was one of the key architects of the Human Genome Project, and Washington University became an epicenter for genomics when the Genome Project launched. It meant that I got to participate in the Human Genome Project as a postdoctoral fellow and also as a, as a resident in pathology from the very beginning 
And I built my career on it ever since and was able to participate in the Human Genome Project from beginning to end. I became an assistant professor in 1992 at Washington University because I looked elsewhere but thought that was the best offer I got. But then things changed for me because fortuitously, Francis Collins um, became the head of what was then the National Center for Human Genome Research. And he called me just shortly after I started my assistant professorship at WashU and said, I am going to head up the, the Genome Institute, or that was then a center at NIH, and um, we're gonna create a new on-campus intramural research program. Do you wanna join me? And I almost instantaneously said yes, and my wife and I picked up and we moved to NIH. Uh, I arrived there as a midstream tenure track investigator in 1994, and then within two years was tenured. Shortly after that, became a center director for a sequencing center that I founded. And then uh, by 2002, I had the opportunity to apply for and was selected to be the intramural director, which at an NIH institute is called the scientific director. And then when Francis Collins was appointed by President Obama to be the NIH director, he left a vacancy at what was then the Genome Institute, and I applied for and was appointed by him um, to be uh, the institute direct, the new institute director for NHGRI, and that was in 2009. So that takes me to about 15 years ago. Um, and for the past, past 15 years, I have been honored and delighted to be the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, it is an institute that has had uh, three directors. It's a little intimidating to point out that the previous two directors were Jim Watson, who, um, uh, as many of you know, is a Nobel laureate, uh, co-discoverer of the double helical structure of DNA. Um, and then after Jim departed, Francis Collins became director. And then, as I just told you, Francis appointed me to be his successor. Um, those were some pretty big shoes to fill, but it's been a, it's an amazing 15-year ride. The thing I will tell you about being an institute director, just so you can appreciate it, is that you have this, you, you can't possibly run an NIH institute without an incredible leadership team helping you. Um, and this is, uh, um, it's slightly outdated, but this is a fairly recent um, uh, showing of my key leadership team that without uh, them, I could simply not run the institute and it would, and it would be no re as successful as it is. But you also have a responsibility as an NIH director, not only to work with your leadership team to run your institute, you're also part of a larger leadership group that you lead up with and you help run the entire NIH. And this is um, that leadership group of all the 27 institute and center directors, various other people in the office of the director working with the NIH director and the NIH deputy director and so forth. And that is a good third of my job is probably working um, to help run the NIH more broadly as part of this amazing group of institute directors. And then the other thing to point out about my career, I always like to stress is that when you enter a professional career, you, you know, it takes on different personas at different stages along the way. I have had different personas. There's just no question. When I was a genomics researcher and I was there working on the Human Genome Project, developing technologies, applying genomic uh, advances to all new areas that I got so excited about being able to be involved with, including human genetics, you know, I, and I like movie analogies. I sort of, my persona was this guy, I mean, this Emmett Brown from Back to the Future movies, just ridiculously active, energetic, uh, crazy-eyed, and all sorts of wild ideas. That was me uh, during the Genome uh, Project and beyond. When I had to close my lab about 13 years, or I chose to close my lab about 13 years ago and assume much more leadership roles, especially as the, for the past 15 years, as an institute director, you, you, you have a different movie persona. In fact, I would say it's more like this guy here. It's more like, you know, the Wizard of Oz. You know, people bring you problems and you try to solve them and it's very altruistic and then you just want to be happy seeing them be happy by having you solve their problems or having you set up a circumstance where they get what they need to do. And so it is a very different um, persona in the last 15 years than the, the previous part of my career. Um, in reality, the other thing you do as an institute director is you do a lot of this. It's a lot of whack the mole kind of game. You're just constantly knocking down problems, and then 10 seconds later, something else comes up. But if you ask me, what do you do on a daily basis? Metaphorically, I would say I, I play a lot of whack a mole because that's what it feels like. Um, wrapping up, uh, a couple other things I'm very um, um, a strong believer in is that I, fortune cookies don't lie. 
Um, truly, here are two fortune cookies I've gotten um, in, in recent years. Uh, one is I'm a bundle of energy. I'm always on the go. Anybody who works with me knows that's absolutely true. Um, and then the second fortune cookie that I got, seriously, that didn't lie, it said I could prosper in the field of medical research, and hopefully people think I have. So that's my introduction to myself. Um, I hope you can appreciate. I will leave you with one more um, um, slide that hopefully you, you immediately picked up on um, from um, hearing this introduction is no matter what you can say about me and uh, no matter what you think of me, I will just tell you that I really do take what I do very seriously. I'm amazingly proud of being the Institute Director. I'm amazingly proud of being involved in genomics for my entire career. Uh, but believe me, at the same time, I never take myself too seriously. And um, here's a photo of uh, one of many times where I have humiliated myself in front of my institute. Um, and I do it on a regular basis, uh, if nothing else, to make people laugh. So I never take myself too seriously. And I think that's a, a really important thing to carry forward um, when you think about how you represent yourself to your um, uh, colleagues, um, especially in a professional setting. Okay, that's the introduction. Now, what I wanna do is uh, shift gears and focus on the topic that I was excited to come and talk about in this colloquium. And I wanted to talk about it early. I let Larry Brody appropriately sort of lay a context about DNA sciences and genetics and a little bit about genomics. But I also thought it was very valuable for this series to have an early lecture about uh, the history of genomics as a field and in particular, um, a really good uh, description of the Human Genome Project. And I've gotten particularly passionate about telling the story of the Human Genome Project because more and more, especially younger people, are reading about this in their history books, getting excited about it, um, and, um, and recognize that this really is an amazing story of human advance that um, really is worthy of the kind of storytelling that I think I can bring to it. And so I really want to tell this very much as a story. I would start off um, to set up the story of the Human Genome Project by pointing out that um, in many ways, there were really two scientific fields, both of which got launched at the different ends of the last century that now I think are just gonna change medicine considerably this century. And so much about this colloquium is gonna be about describing how many aspects of medicine are gonna be changed by these fields. I mean, the first field was genetics. And I wanna point out that the word genetics uh, was first coined and first put into the literature in 1904, 1907, I'm sorry. And that's important to keep in mind. It's a field that's been around well over a century now. Um, and it is a field that is well known um, to many people and everybody learns about it in biology, et cetera, et cetera, because it came into being an early part of the last century. Of course, at about the midway part of the last century was this incredible discovery based on Rosalind Franklin's incredible images that were then interpreted um, by others and um, who were able to, along with her, put together um, this incredible a um, set of insights that led to the elucidation of the structure of the double helical structure of, of the, the structure of DNA in, in the form of a double helix. Of course, this earned people Nobel prizes, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody knows that story. Um, but that was sort of the midway point. And, and then, of course, that led up to something that I'm going to tell you about, which is the the coining of the word genomics and the launching of a new field of genomics that came 80 years or so after you actually had um, the first uh, publication using the word uh, genetics in it. And so that really is an important thing. I think genetics and genomics really are together, um, starting with the story I'm about to tell you, um, are gonna change medicine this century. Well, any good story um, often starts with a prologue and uh, the story of human genomics and the Human Genome Project in particular absolutely has a prologue. Um, the prologue of the Human Genome Project was something called the Molecular Biology Revolution uh, that took place in the early 70s and then into the early 80s. Um, I was a graduate student during it. I'm very familiar with the Molecular Biology Revolution. It was very exciting. And it was all about developing tools uh, for analyzing um, pieces of DNA 
and um, different areas of DNA and so on and so forth. So DNA cloning came to the fore in the 1970s. Um, the method, the first couple of methods for sequencing the letters of DNA uh, were developed in 1977. You will hear about the method shown um, on, on this illustration, Sanger DNA sequencing, as it's called. And I'll refer to Sanger sequencing as one of the two methods uh, developed in 1977. Um, actually, both of those methods are Nobel Prizes. Uh, but Kim Doheny will be coming to this series in September, during which she will describe not only the Sanger method of sequencing, but all the new methods that have followed ever since then. Um, and then by the early 80s, other methods such as uh, the polymerase chain reaction, which is used for amplifying segments of DNA, was an, yet, an, add a, a yet another tool to the toolkit of molecular biologists. But what was really um, important to appreciate is that all of these tools in molecular biology were very good at analyzing a piece of DNA here or a piece of DNA here or a piece of DNA here, but they were getting better and better throughout the 1980s in particular. And it started to be discussed that, wow, this is so inefficient. We're, we're going about just sort of analyzing DNA here and there. Why don't we consider analyzing all the DNA of an organism? And all the DNA of an organism is, of course, called its, its genome. And so the idea was, could we advance all of these tools of molecular biology that were provided in this prologue to make them so efficient that we could actually tackle the complete mapping and sequencing of genomes. And if we could, could we imagine organizing ourselves to do that in a very systematic way? So that really led to a drumbeat of discussions that took place that really led up to the beginning of the Human Genome Project. There were some um, historical sketches that were published uh, from a meeting that was convened in, in, in the mid part of 1980 to a, a, a perspective that was written by a very prominent um, cancer researcher in 1986. There's the actual naming of the field genomics and the first use of the word genomics that I told you about in an earlier slide in 1987. But then scientists and others got very serious and started to organize around meetings and started writing up some ideas about what a, uh, a project might look like that might tackle the sequencing um, of entire genomes of a series of organisms. And uh, the National Research Council put out um, such an idea in 1988, and that was followed by um, yet another government agency putting out a different but overlapping set of ideas in 1988. And there were even congressional hearings that took place because Congress was going to, the U.S. was going to need to fund this. And so by 1989, there were congressional hearings to get this off the ground. This, of course, would eventually coalesce around a single big international project called the Human Genome Project. Now, what was initially envisioned for the Human Genome Project? Well, there's sort of five things. One, it was expected to be 15 years, roughly, based on the envisioned plan for the effort. Second, the idea was not to lunge right into human, but rather to first study some model organisms. Otherwise, these are well-studied experimental organisms, um, each of which would have smaller genomes than the human genome, and get experience on how to map and sequence a genome, and then eventually move over to map and sequence the human genome. In each case, the idea was we got to get all the DNA organized so that we could then sequence the DNA. So you organize first, that's mapping, and then you read the DNA next, which is called sequencing. The fourth thing that was envisioned was that we needed all new methods. The, when the Genome Project began in 1990, everybody said, we will wait to sequence the human genome after we have revolutionary DNA sequencing methods. We needed to replace that Sanger DNA sequencing method, which was really good, but didn't seem at the time like it was going to be good enough to sequence something as big as the human genome. At least that was the idea at the launch. And then fifth, the idea was the signature goal of the Human Genome Project was going to be sequencing the human genome for the very first time. And that was going to always be sort of the big celebratory signature aspect of the Human Genome Project. So that's what was envisioned in 1990 when the project got off the ground. So let me give you some spoiler alerts now. The first idea, 15 years, uh-uh, that's an overestimate. It only took 13. Number two, gain experience with model organisms, then go to human. Absolutely. It's exactly what we did. It was maintained. Number three, map the genome, then sequence the genome. Yeah, mostly maintained. A little deviation I'll tell you about, but mostly maintained. 
Number four, don't start sequencing human DNA with Sanger methods. You need all new revolutionary methods if you're ever going to really sequence the human genome. Wrong. That idea was abandoned. I'll tell you why it was abandoned along the way. Number five, make generating the human genome sequence the signature accomplishment. Absolutely true to this day and forever will be the signature accomplishment of the Human Genome Project was generating that first sequence of the human genome. So let me um, put a little more texture around the organisms that were selected for the Human Genome Project. The idea was pick classic model organisms because they were heavily studied in many laboratories in addition to human, but also uh, with the exception of mouse, which has roughly the same size genome as human, the classic organisms that were studied by the Genome Project, fruit fly, nematode, worm, and yeast, they all um, not only have much smaller genomes, but importantly, they represent distinct points on the evolutionary tree, which would therefore provide a lot of um, insights about genomic changes that have taken place in genomes over the course of literally millions and millions of years of evolution. So this was the logic behind the set of organisms that were selected uh, for uh, analysis in the Human Genome Project. Um, to understand how the Human Genome Project did what, it's did, what it did and, um, and, and how it moved forward, I like the metaphor, which I think I've been using uh, to teach this um, ever since the Genome Project began, uh, going back to 1990. And the, the metaphor is to consider books um, uh, to conceptualize genomes. And the size of the books um, and the number of books would therefore dictate how big different genomes are. It's also a good analogy because the idea of um, mapping and sequencing could be analogous to organizing the books and getting the pages all in the right order. And then that would be the mapping phase. And then the sequencing phase would be opening up the books and actually reading the A, G's, T's, and C's on each page of each book in an organized way. And so shown here sort of once again emphasizes that the human and mouse genome are roughly 3 billion letters, um, whereas the fruit fly and nematode are more like 100,000 or 160 um, or 100, 100 million or 160 million. And then the yeast you can see is even considerably smaller. And so you get the idea that this is the different scale that had to be contemplated um, as we embarked on really eventually sequencing uh, these uh, genomes and filling these books with the actual letters in order of uh, all of the, the DNA in all of these organisms. So the Human Genome Project began on October 1 of 1990. And I want to take you back in time, uh, knowing that some people watching this probably weren't even born. So let me, let me let you know what life was like when the Genome Project began. We were a modern civilization on October 1 of 1990. But a lot of things that we are familiar with today in our everyday life that makes us feel like we are in a sophisticated contemporary society, many of those things did not exist when the Human Genome Project began on October 1 of 1990. Let me give you examples. There were no web pages when the Genome Project began. In fact, it's estimated that only 3 million people in the entire world had access to the internet when the Genome Project began. But there were no organized web pages. They just had access to the internet for conveying information. But formal web pages didn't become available until one year into the Human Genome Project. There was no texting. And on each case, I'm showing you what year these things came into be during the Human Genome Project. Live streaming didn't come in until year three. Uh, web browsers didn't become available till the third year of the Genome Project. The Sony PlayStation, not until the fourth year. GPSs, not until 1995. Amazon didn't exist until 95. Microsoft Windows didn't exist until 1995, nor did USB cables. DVDs only came on the scene in 96. Wi-Fi only became available in 97. Google didn't become available until 98. And social media didn't exist until 10 years into the Human Genome Project. Oh, that's just during the Genome Project. If we now add to that what became available after the Human Genome Project was completed, um, throughout the entire Human Genome Project, we never had Facebook, we never had iPhones, and we never had Siri. So uh, you know, when the Genome Project began in 1990, we, it was a pretty prehistoric time. None of these things were available, and somehow we were going to do something as crazy and audacious as map and sequence the human genome. 
Now, we did have cameras back then. They were film cameras, but we did have cameras to capture things on film. And so fortunately, photos were taken at the time. And so you could see, here's a great photo of me arriving to work to get going and work on the Human Genome Project. So that's where things were in 1990, and that's how uh, that's our transportation mode uh, back then in this prehistoric time when the Human Genome Project began. More seriously, what were some of the realities of the Human Genome Project at the launch in 1990? Well, first reality is not everybody liked the idea of the Human Genome Project. There were mixed opinions about the Human Genome Project. Um, I think most people were in favor, but there were some loud uh, individuals who weren't necessarily thinking this was the best use of money, um, and so there were mixed opinions. Second of all, do not think that even though there were some uh, publications that talked about a human genome project, there were no detailed start to finish plans for the human genome project. It was a figure it out as you go. It was a fly the, build the airplane as you fly it. We did not have an absolute plan. We really figured this out one step at a time. And also keep in mind, it wasn't like we had a massive community of genomicists all available to work on the project. In fact, the field had only gotten named in 87. The project got launched in 1990. Genomics was a toddler field then. It was basically growing up as a melting pot of what I call scientific immigrants from other disciplines. I came in it as a physician scientist in cell biology. A lot of other people came from different genetics areas, whether it be model organism genetics or human genetics. We brought in physicists. We brought in um, ethicists. We brought in chemists. We brought in engineers. We brought in, you know, et cetera, legal scholars, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody coming in was new to the field. It wasn't like we had an existing community ready to go on this. And then as I pointed out, we had a painfully, painfully nascent internet. And I, that really had implications. Uh, you're going to be shocked knowing what you all know now about how genomic data is transmitted on the internet and stored on the in the cloud and, sto and, and stored in big servers, et cetera, et cetera. When the Human Genome Project began, the way sequence data of DNA was, was made available, it was by books that were published. And it was only a few years into the Human Genome Project that all of the sequence data that was available at that time would be distributed on, on CDs. CDs that were actually mailed around. Um, uh, like every six months, they'd mail out a new set of CDs of all the sequence that was available in places like GenBank. And, and I'm not kidding you, when we first started, and I was, it was, this involved me, started generating some sequence data to make um, markers to start mapping the human genome, the way my collaborator would send me that data was not by an email or by the internet, that really wasn't functional enough yet. He used to fax it to me, literally on a fax machine that looked just like that. So this was the painfully early days of the internet where we were using faxes and books and, and CDs, it, and it's laughable now, but I think it's important to appreciate how much things have changed and how critical it was that the internet develop as sophisticated as it has, um, because without it, I think the Genome Project would have been a very difficult thing to actually finish, and it was already difficult enough just to get it started. The other thing about the Genome Project at, at its beginning was how it was being implemented. Um, so appreciate the fact that it was international, um, not only in how it was being funded, but also the people who were participating in the project. In the United States, um, there were two funders. The major funder was the National Institutes of Health, and um, particularly uh, the, what was then the National Center for Human Genome Research. Uh, but also the other U.S. government agency was the Department of Energy, who were very interested in DNA mutation and the possible effects of different energy sources with respect to, to DNA changes that might take place um, influenced by those energy sources. Other countries that were involved either had government funding or private funders. Uh, the Wellcome Trust was the other major partner in Europe, for example, and a major partner with the NIH and um, um, in funding the, the what was the, the Sager Center, later became the Sager Institute. So this was put together a group of funders and a groups of international scientists who were going to pursue the project. It was done in a very consortium-based way. It was part of the controversy that biologists didn't really like big consortium, but this was going to have to be done in a team science consortium way. 
And um, it was going to have to be managed um, and really coordinated, very in, heavy involvement of the funders, heavy involvement of the staff and uh, who have the funding agencies to really monitor how the project was going and making sure that it got done um, well. Now, it, it, as once the Genome Project began, um, the consortium and the advisors of the project would get together frequently and um, would constantly monitor progress and also monitor what might need to be changed strategically. And so, in fact, the Genome Project was guided by three successive, and you, you can see slightly overlapping, strategic visions. Because we got going, and then we realized a few years in, wow, we got to change our strategy. So we came up with a new five-year plan by 1993. And then by the time that five-year plan had finished, we were ready to publish a new one, uh, which was published then in 1998. These strategic visions were critically important to communicate to everybody, both in the project and those watching the project, how we were pursuing the Human Genome Project and how we were actually slightly changing how we were building the airplane even while we were flying that airplane. Now to appreciate how we sequence these genomes, um, let me remind everybody that, that genomes are organized by chromosomes. Um, model organisms have smaller and some kind, and in most cases, fewer chromosomes. And uh, the human genome has um, larger chromosomes as I showed you earlier, and it has, um, in this case of the human genome, a total of 24. And so the, a lot of the way the mapping and sequencing was done for yeast and worms and flies and humans was, was organized around these chromosomes, first to map and then eventually to sequence. Again, to build out this metaphor, it is worthwhile to think about the scale of genomes and chromosomes and clones um, so if, if focusing on the human genome, which is what, we're, what the signature accomplishment of the Human Genome Project was, we needed to basically take a 24-volume encyclopedia set, volumes 1 through 22, X and Y, just like chromosomes 1 through 22, X and Y. In total, there was about 3 billion letters um, that we had to determine the order of, volume by volume, one by one across the human genome. Each of those chromosomes averaged, they differ in size, but they averaged about 130 megabases of sequence, 130 million letters of sequence. And of course, realize that one human chromosome is roughly the size of the entire fruit fly or nematode genome. So once again, you can get a sense of the scale difference between the model organisms and the human genome. And without getting into the technical details, what I can tell you is when the Genome Project began, it was very clear that we were going to have to take vol each volume off the shelf and study it. And we were going to study it with two different cloning systems, one that gave us big pieces of DNA, these larger clones, that would give us essentially chapter by chapter ordering of each volume. And then in the next mapping phase, we went to a set of smaller clones that would allow us to go into each chapter and order each of the pages within each chapter. So without worrying about the technical details of what are now basically retired uh, cloning methods, just think of them as big clones for chapters, small clones for pages, and get in there and figure out what the order of these are. The way this was done, and this was what I got involved in in the Human Genome Project, I was mapping a human chromosome using clones. Um, the idea is that the chromosome was a book, we would break that book apart. We'd isolate chunks of, of each of the books. The larger clones would get like chapters, you know, multiple pages, and the smaller clones would get individual pages. And then we would do all sorts of things to figure out how the different clo chapters or clones um, um, relate to each other. And when they'd have things in common, they must therefore have DNA in common. And so you could basically overlap them and figure out sort of in a successive, what are known as a tiling path, organize these either chapters on the left or clones on the right. And these are what are known as clone contigs. Contigs represent a contiguous region of the starting DNA represented by a series of overlapping clones. And so this was the paradigm for mapping a genome before you would actually sequence it. And I'll show you now real data from chromosome 7, which is one of the human chromosomes um, of, of the human genome, and uh, looking at actually what a result would be with the smaller clones. So shown here 
is a tiling path of clones that had been very carefully mapped out. This probably would represent like one chapter, if you will, of volume seven, but now you're looking at the page by page relationships. And then we'd go in and we'd pick overlapping pages and that's shown in red. And those clones would be selected for then going about and sequencing, actually reading out all the letters. And so this is a nice tiling path that got us across this chapter of volume seven, i.e. chromosome seven. Now I should point out as a caveat, the metaphor is imperfect because real books, is, books have page breaks between them, whereas we couldn't afford page breaks, we needed to have the clone slightly overlapping. So the metaphor breaks down a little because you have overlapping pages, not crisp page breaks. But I think you get the idea um, of, of what we're trying to accomplish. So then for every single human chromosome, the idea would be to have these clone maps. You pick one clone in red, you take the set of red clones, and then each one of those clones would be sequenced. And the method that was used for this is something called shotgun sequencing. And here's a definition and here's a nice illustration. And I would point you, if you're not aware of NHGRI's talking glossary of um, genomic and genetic terms, you should get familiar with it because it's wonderful. It has incredible sets of definitions of lots of commonly used genomic and genetic terms, almost always associated with really illustrative figures such as that shown here. But I will just tell you that um, Adam Filippi, an expert about sequencing genomes, is coming in to talk at this colloquium in September, and he's going to tell you about all the nuances and complexities of actually sequencing either um, um, one of these clones, as was done in the Human Genome Project, or sequencing whole genomes. But all of this is a, a modified way or modifications of basic shotgun sequencing, which the way I like to think of it is just imagine taking those pages one at a time, take one page, go over to a Xerox machine, make a whole bunch of copies, just purify a lot of DNA from it, and then put that big stack of copies in a paper shredder and get a whole lot of shreds of text, and then just using some sequencing method, read out all the different shreds of text. So you have lots and lots and lots of what are called sequence reads, you feed all that into a computer and it, it stitches it all together to give you a sequence. Now, I incredibly oversimplified that and it's incredibly complicated. I'm gonna leave it to Adam to describe in greater detail, but just imagine what the Human Genome Project did was to sit there and get chapter by chapter orders of each volume, then page by page, and then took each page and read it through the shotgun sequencing uh, uh, um, uh, set of steps that involved shredding it up reading out let of sentences at a time, and then stitching it all back together using computational methods. So that's the fundamental strategy that was used for mapping and sequencing genomes in the Human Genome Project. So I'm gonna pause here and declare this as, as the first set of questions and answers, um, and then I'll tell you more stories about how we actually uh, got through uh, the Human Genome Project. So I'm gonna I'm gonna look up now at and see. Um, you're welcome to either put something in the Q and A, or you can raise your hand, or you could just speak up. Are there any questions at this point? Where did my questions go? Here we go. Hey, Dr. Green, can yeah. you can you hear me? Yeah, Cam. Okay. Hey, this is Cameron, Education Fellow. Hi, hey, Cameron. Um, I feel like we've heard this before, but I just want to, I mean, make it, I guess, remember it. The, all this work that you're talking about was to sequence one human genome. Like you had a sample from one person, and this was all the work to do like one sample of a human genome. Cameron, I'm, I'm going to table, it's a great question, and I'm actually going to, uh, in about seven slides from now, yeah, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to exactly tell you whose genome did we sequence anyway. Gotcha. So I, 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 it's a great question, and it's one of the most commonly asked questions uh, because it's a great question, and I'm going to answer it. I'm mostly interested right now, by the way, in any questions about strategy, because the next part of I mean, I'm going to talk a little more about strategy, but I'm also going to tell you about sort of sort of some of these details about what was actually done and whose genome and some of the other drama that took place. So I see somebody just raised their hand, but then went away. Or oh, maybe. it's me. It's me, Doctor. Um, Hi, Eric Green, Gustavo from. Uh, Hi, Gustavo. Uh, builds builds lab. Um, yeah. So I was 
I was curious what difference was the strategy or what, um, so the strategy that you follow uh, in what differs uh, from the strategy that probably was followed by Celera. Oh, I'm going to tell you. Country. Oh boy, oh, you okay. guys really are excited about the next part of my talk. I'm going to tell you in all sorts of details about what the, this private company Celera Genomics did. So, so let me let me explain that shortly, and then at the end, when we're the second Q and A, if I didn't answer it fully, you should ask me. How's that? Any other questions now? Everybody's hungry for the second half of my talk. I can tell, which is great. Susan, do we see any others? Oh, I don't see any. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep marching along then. So let's let's get into it. So, so it turns out that things started working for the Human Genome Project um, uh, for these model organisms. Uh, you know, in terms of the yeast genome, and then the nematode worm genome, and then the Drosophila genome, and they were all featured on the cover of these very prominent scientific journals. And so we had sort of gotten what we wanted. We demonstrated that we were able to scale up what was needed um, to be able to sequence these model organisms. And so attention increasingly went to the human genome. Um, and as I mentioned early on, the human genome uh, sequencing in particular, and the whole strategy for mapping and sequencing was a divide and conquer. Um, I got involved with my postdoc mentor, Maynard Olson, and I basically signed up to map and, and help sequence chromosome seven as part of the Human Genome Project. And there you can see me working with Bader, and then you can see on the wall behind me in the lower photo on the right is one of these contigs. This was actually a chapter by chapter contig for a big stretch of chromosome seven. So literally this is what we were doing early on in the Genome Project, and then eventually got to the point where it was time to start sequencing um, the human genome. Now, what were the challenges of sequencing the human genome? Well, first thing is it's big. I mean, three billion, big number. It's a lot of letters, it's finite, but it's still big. Um, it also was particularly big when you considered what Sanger sequencing could deliver back in the 1990s. It only gave you about five to 800 letters at a time. So we had to sequence three billion, but we could only read about five to 800 of them at a time, uh, which was part of the concern of could it ever work with Sanger sequencing. One of the other things about sequencing a genome is that it's not that you just got to read every letter once. You actually have to, for accuracy reasons, you need to read it many, many times, like over 30 times each. In fact, we often use a phrase of coverage or redundancy. Coverage meaning what's the number of times any given base in, the, in DNA is read. And in order to do it right, back, especially back then, you'd have to do it at least 30 times. And then if out of the 30 times, most of the time you thought it was a G, you could pretty much safely say it was a G, but you needed that level of redundancy to statistically feel that you could accurately say what the letter was at that position in the genome. But what really confounded things as reflected by pushing this boulder up the mountain was that you know half of the human genome consisted of very repetitive DNA. Uh, much of it turns out to be remnants of these things called transposable elements, but if, if all of the DNA in the human genome was unique, it'd be easy to piece this together compared to the reality of the situation. Uh, and that is that half the DNA looks like, like itself. I mean, it's just a very repetitive. And that makes it very hard to put all this together in the computer. And Adam Filippi is going to give you a much uh, more detailed explanation of how hard this is, and particularly in some regions of the genome. And so this became a major obstacle of just being able to assemble all those shreds of text accurately together to get even a single page accurate, let alone getting it all across uh, each chapter and eventually each, each uh, chromosome, each volume, in other words. So how did it happen? I mean, how did we go off and generate that first human genome sequence? Well, the initial plan of the human genome project was something that looked like this. And I've already laid out the, the, the elements of this, but I'll remind you. Volume by volume, chromosome by chromosome. One chromosome at a time, order the pages, first order chapters, then order pages, and then take each page, generate a lot of sequence reads, assemble that, and then eventually stitch together page three next to page four, next to page five, and eventually have contiguous sequence across each chromosome. The reason we got optimistic by about 1997, 1998, that we could actually do this with Sanger sequencing was that for the first six or seven years of the Human Genome Project, 
we developed a lot of automation and, and we got better and better machines for doing Sanger sequencing, such as the set of machines shown in this factory. And it was, it was incremental evolutionary improvements to Sager sequencing that eventually led to a revolutionary advance in sequencing at the time that achieved um, enough capacity to allow us to sequence the human genome. Nobody ever anticipated we'd get it to be that automated and that efficient when the Genome Project began, but we were able to do it. And it was aided by a lot of computational power to piece it all together because it then became a big computational puzzle to deal with all the complexities of the repeats of the human genome and so forth. And so at the end of the day, because of the new machines that came out and the new robotics associated with them, it was decided that, yeah, we don't need a revolutionary new method for sequencing DNA. We think we got it good enough to sequence the human genome. And so off we went with a, at the end of the day, the human genome was sequenced for the first time by about six countries, about 20 centers, each with factory looking things like you see in the middle, thousands of researchers. When the real hard sequencing was being done of the human genome, it took place over a period of about six years where a thousand bases of sequence were being generated across the world every second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it all was made possible by just brute force using not new methods for sequencing DNA, which is what we use today, um, and, but rather brute force methods um, of just incremental, a lot of incremental improvements to Sanger DNA sequencing, coupled with um, a lot of computational horsepower. Now, that leads to one of the most common questions, including a question I got asked um, during the, the first Q&A session. Whose genome was sequenced anyway? Well, it turns out that there's an interesting story associated with it. Because remember, I told you that um, at the end of the day, we were going to sequence the genome one page at a time, one clone at a time, using those smaller clones. And those smaller clones that I highlighted in red on an earlier slide, which were known as bacterial artificial chromosomes. Um, and I didn't tell you that at the time, otherwise abbreviated BACs or BAC clones. And it turned out that when attention finally was paid to the sequencing of the human genome, we realized we needed to make some new back libraries of human DNA. And the person who was the world expert on making the highest quality back clones happened to have a laboratory in Buffalo, New York. And so what that individual did was to place this ad in the newspaper, in a Buffalo newspaper to say, hey, if you want to be involved in the Human Genome Project, we need a bunch of volunteers. And if you're willing to volunteer, we will um, collect your blood anonymously during a blood donation, and um, your DNA may get selected. And so that's what happened. A whole bunch of people's DNA, was uh, they volunteered, they gave their blood. Some of these were selected, and some of these were sequenced. Now, it turns out that due to a whole series of circumstances that are, that are um, uh, scientifically complicated because it had to do with how all these um, um, maps of all these clones got put together. At the end of the day, one of those donors represents 70% of the sequence produced by the Human Genome Project. So the Genome Project produced a sequence of a bunch of people, um, um, and but 70% of the sequence came from one individual because 70% of the sequence came from clones from the one library. So that's one blood donor. Now, there were about 19 other people. So a total of 20 people in a like a patchwork quilt or a mosaic represented what the Human Genome Project actually produced as its human sequence. But, but, but those other 19 people comprised 30% of the total. You know, 10 of those were, were donors in Buffalo and another uh, 10, at least 10 accounted for 23. So 93% of the sequence produced by the human genome really reflect Buffalo blood donors, and the remaining 7% or so represent some other people in other libraries. So when you think about what the Human Genome Project produced, it was just a mosaic representation of multiple people. This is what we refer to as a reference sequence. Yeah, 70% of it came from one person, but all the rest of it came from a whole bunch of other people. And so it wasn't any one person who was sequenced. So that's one really important thing to keep in mind about what the Human Genome Project produced. Now, keep in mind, the reason why none of this really matters from the point of view of, of scientific um, the rationale for this is that any one of our genomes is 99.6% identical to anybody else's genome. 
So for the most part, the very first sequence produced by the Human Genome Project was going to be 99.6% identical to any other genome. So this was good enough for generating that very first sequence of a human genome. Now, the other thing, um, oh, there is a humorous aside, I should point out. I literally was at the meeting when they were trying to make decisions about whose genome should we sequence anyway. You would have thought we thought about this in the beginning. We didn't think about that seriously until about 96. And as a humorous aside, somebody at this meeting raised their hand and strongly advocated that they didn't care who we were going to pick to sequence in the Human Genome Project, but we better pick somebody normal as if any of us really understood what normal was and thinking about a bunch of people sitting in a room trying to have this discussion, none of us were particularly normal, but it was just interesting that somebody actually classified somebody as normal and that was essential, which was a silly thought. Any case, another important um, um, storyline that came out of the Human Genome Project relates to data sharing. And it turns out that one of the big legacies of the Human Genome Project um, relates to the attention it paid to the release and sharing of its uh, genome sequence data that it was producing. And what happened was that the people involved in the genome project felt very strongly that the data should be released almost immediately, not the conventional way of either never sharing your data or only sharing it after publication. And But in order to accomplish such a change in um, routine, it ended up requiring a couple of meetings. Uh, they were held in Bermuda. The reason they were held in Bermuda is we wanted to meet somewhere between uh, the UK, where were heavy, heavy um, participants of the Genome Project, and the US, which had a lot of participants of the Human Genome Project, and halfway in between is only the ocean except for some islands, so we picked a British colony of Bermuda, and two pivotal meetings were held there that ended up leading to a landmark agreement for rapid data release and public access to Human Genome Project sequence data, unprecedented. In, 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 in biomedical research to have the data shared in that fashion. And um, these became known as the Bermuda Principles. And this is really important because it really represents one of the most important legacies of the Human Genome Project. Nowadays, here at NIH and really around the world, biomedical researchers share data much more than they ever shared data before. It's a direct outgrowth of the Bermuda Principles, which really only came to be because of the Human Genome Project's altruistic views about data sharing. So that's another important thing. But now, any good story, like the story of the Human Genome Project, has drama. And without drama, sometimes it's just another story, but with drama, it has that extra spicy aspect to it. So there was drama in the Human Genome Project. It got hinted at in one of the questions during the, the Q&A session because there was something else going on beyond the Human Genome Project. So I'm going to introduce to you, and by the way, any good story with any good drama has protagonists. So here are the protagonists of the Human Genome Project story. First, first you have Francis Collins. Went to University of Virginia, brilliant scientist, incredible physician, um, prolific author, has lots of uh, you know incredible storylines associated with him came, was recruited to run the Genome Institute and help by, by de facto leadership leading the International Human Genome Project as the field general. But there was another protagonist, and that's this guy, Craig Venter. Uh, he was a California dude. He went to UC San Diego. Uh, he also wrote books and gets featured on magazines and so forth. So forth. But this became a bit of a drama for the following reasons. And so let me tell you more about our two protagonists. Francis is a a medical geneticist. He was participating in the Human Genome Project when he was at University of Michigan, um, but then he became director of the NIH's Genome Institute, as I told you earlier, succeeding Jim Watson, becoming the de facto leader of the International Consortium. Um, later, and I'm fast forwarding later, he was appointed by the NIH director by to become NIH director by President Obama. So, you know, the, he's the good guy in this story, right? Okay, and then there's somebody else. Okay, then there's Craig Venter. So Craig actually worked at NIH. Um, he was actually right here in our intramural research program when the Human Genome Project began. Um, he started, he had another idea. Actually, Craig's brilliant. Um, and Craig has a lot of really great ideas. And one of them was to uh, not so much focus on DNA, but to also focus on RNA and to get little bits and pieces of, of RNA sequence uh, by sequencing cDNAs, and he called them express sequence tags, because that would give insights about genes as a shortcut to, to, to study the human genome. 
Um, and But it also gave him an opportunity to get insights about genes so he could patent them. So he began patenting human genes at a ferocious pace that caused a lot of controversy. And in fact, it caused so much controversy, he actually left NIH and he founded a private research institute. And then he got actually funded to participate in the Human Genome Project. But while he was participating in the Human Genome Project, Craig got a little impatient. In fact, he just thought the Genome Project was going too slow. So he left the Genome Project and he joined forces with the very company that commercialized those new automated instruments for very high throughput DNA sequencing that I showed you in that slide of the factory that was sequencing human DNA. So that company was making these automated sequencing instruments and he joined forces with that company to form a new company called Celera Genomics. And that new company aimed to compete with the Human Genome Project by generating a sequence of the human, genome pro uh, the human genome faster than the Genome Project. And in doing so, they were selling subscriptions for money to access their human genome sequence. And number two, they were going to patent a bunch of genes along the way as well. So this became a race. It became a race or a purported race uh, between the public Human Genome Project and the private company Solera. Now, the other aspect of the race has a scientific um, element that you need to appreciate. Because the idea was, Craig's criticism of the Human Genome Project was that we were trying to do things too slow. We were doing things clone by clone, or first chapter by chapter, then clone by clone. And so that was our initial plan. And Craig said it had a different plan. He said, forget the clones. Let's just take the whole set of encyclopedias and just put all of those together in the paper shredder and then generate bazillions of sequence reads and then just turn it all over to a computer. And that one was known as a whole genome shotgun strategy. Um, and the idea was take the whole genome shotgun sequence and feed it all in. And therefore, you could forget all of this slow stuff with mapping and all the slow stuff, stuff of doing one clone at a time. And so it was sort of an analogous to sort of the, he called us, you know, the tortoise and he was the hare because he could do it quicker because he was doing it smarter and faster. The, there was a, a slightly unfair aspect of that because it wasn't very fair because we were releasing the data in the Human Genome Project, but he wasn't releasing his data. So he could pull all the Human Genome Project's data and combine it with his whole genome sequence data and, and have far more data to be able to put it all together. And so, yeah, you could call it a race, but it wasn't a very fair race because he had access to our data, but not vice versa. Well, the purported race started to not sit well with lots of people. It became a little bit of a contentious thing of the private sector versus the public sector, uh, a government-funded effort versus a private effort. It, it just wasn't going well. Nobody was liking this the competitive rhetoric that it was associated with it. And so somebody needed to step in and help try to solve, you know, sort of lower the temperature and solve the problem of having a race that would not go well um, or may not go well for somebody. And that someone was uh, uh, President Clinton and uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair. Um, but at the end of the day, and with a lot of negotiations behind the scenes going on, it was uh, worked out that the race would be declared a tie and that both groups would declare that they had a draft sequence of the human genome and they would do so in a very formal way at a very specific, specific time and that the president of the United States would be there to um, have a ceremonial um, acknowledgement of the tie. And that's exactly what happened at this White House event in June of 2000 with Craig Venter and Francis Collins both speaking at it. And in the middle um, uh, picture, you could see um, a, a TV monitor where actually Tony Blair came in live um, to also congratulate uh, the tie, uh, representing the interests of other countries such as the UK, which were heavily involved. Um, this created an amazing amount of press, as you might imagine, with our two protagonists literally being featured on the cover of Time magazine with a declaration of the race is over. Even Vanity Fair, as you can see on the right, got uh, involved in this. By the way, that photo was taken at the very bottom of the escalators at the NIH Metro stop, the Medical Center Metro stop. Um, and you could see this became, you know, stuff that celebrities are made out of. And, um, but it importantly, was recognized um, to be um, at least a ceremonial tie, if you will. It also was orchestrated that both groups, the public effort and the private effort, would publish 
the draft sequence, this is not the finish, just the draft sequence of the human genome simultaneously um, in uh, major, public, major journals, as you might imagine. That happened um, uh, a few months later, now in February 2001, and Nature published the Human Genome Project's paper describing the draft sequence of the human genome, and Science uh, published um, uh, Venter or Solera's uh, analysis of their draft sequence of the human genome. Uh, yes, I admit I put a little bit of shading around each of these journal covers um, with one shaded in white and one shaded in a darker color, and you could interpret that any way you want. So that's where we were as of February of 2001. But let me tell you then what happened, because after the June 2000 announcement and the February 2001 publications, um, things changed a bit. Uh, Venter and Solera could not fully assemble the human genome sequence and instead admitted that they relied on the publicly available sequence to resolve many of the difficult regions. Um, they had little interest in finalizing the sequence, something called sequence finishing, where you go in and fix every little problem. They had little interest in doing that. They didn't want to do much more than the working draft, which was far from perfect, and so they stopped working on it. The Human Genome Project signed up from the beginning to, make, to finish the job. And so the Human Genome Project continued for the next couple of years to improve that draft sequence, to create a really high quality finish sequence. Um, Solera's business plan to sell subscription and to patent genes eventually failed. Um, and so Venter moved on to other stuff, Solera went away, and uh, the Genome Project uh, finished its task at hand. At the end of the day, and why I do credit uh, Craig Venter with a lot of good ideas, including the idea of whole genome shotgun sequencing, is that the Human Genome Project learned from some of the things that Craig was trying to do and recognized that at the end of the day, it wasn't a one or the other, that they both could work. And so at the end of the day, for the last couple of years of the Genome Project, the thing that helped the Human Genome Project's effort was that we continued moving forward on our initial plan, but we added to it a lot of data that came in from doing some whole genome shotgun so that a hybrid approach was actually what was used at the end of the day, where we merged together data some of it obtained clone by clone, some of it obtained whole genome shotgun, and ultimately that's what yielded uh, the first sequence of the human genome. And therefore, the signature accomplishment of the Human Genome Project. And so when that was completed, um, it was recognized it was time to declare the project over. And so it was decided in April of 2003 that the project would be called a net to be, have been completed. And so the project was declared over in April of 2003, um, there was some uh, deliberate symbolism of having April of 2003 um, because it would then come precisely 50 years after um, uh, the publication of the double helical structure of DNA from 1953. Um, and so everybody appreciated the symbolism of that. Even the U.S. Congress got in the act so that the U.S. Congress actually declared um, April as Human Genome Month, but more specifically as April 25th as National DNA Day to commemorate the twofold accomplishments of the discovery of the double helical structure of DNA, completion of the Human Genome Project, and uh, um, we today, even today and into the future, every single year, we celebrate National DNA Day on, um, on April 25th. Now, like any good story, you have an epilogue. You have a story, and then, uh, I'm sorry, you have a prologue, you have a story, and then you have an, uh, an epilogue. And I'm going to tell you about the epilogue as soon as I tell you about, um, first, the real highlight features of the Human Genome Project. It was completed ahead of schedule, 13 years and under budget. It did exactly what uh, we sought out to do, with our signature accomplishment being to generate an extremely high quality sequence for nine, over 90% of the human genome. If you read the press and if you read all the things that were written, we didn't say we had a complete sequence. We would say we had a near complete or essentially complete. And those words were critical for the epilogue I'm about to tell you about. Um, the cost of sequencing that first human genome, it was a lot, it was a billion dollars. Um, you're gonna hear about in subsequent lectures how that's come down by over a million fold. It was the best billion dollars ever spent, but that first human genome sequence was about a billion dollars. Uh, that race that I told you about between the Human Genome Project and Solera, it melted away eventually um, once the announcement of the draft sequence um, had been done and the, the paper was published in 2001. 
And similarly, the initial concerns about the Human Genome Project from some parts of the scientific community, they've all melted away. They melted away pretty quickly after the Genome Project. And of course, what that's done is to now have set into motion how genomics really is widely being disseminated across biology, medicine, and society, which is very much about what we're going to, you're going to hear about throughout the rest of the colloquium. But let me tell you about this epilogue, because the, sometimes uh, people say, wait a second, I thought I heard recently how the human genome sequence was completed, but I thought that was done like 21 years ago. Well, there was an epilogue element of this that started, uh, that, that came to light uh, just a few years ago. So again, the Human Genome Project was successful, but it only accounted for a sequence that covered 92% of the human genome. The remaining 8% was just not readable with the then available methods for DNA sequencing. You know, there were those, um, the Sanger sequencing had limitations, um, and there were these really complicated regions of centromeres and telomeres that were structurally important, but we couldn't read them. And then there were other reason, regions that were really complicated we couldn't read through, and they were medically important. So there was motivation to figure out that last 8%. But that required the development of all these new revolutionary methods for sequencing DNA that have come on the scene over the last 20 years that Kim Doheny is going to tell you more about. And these new methods, these revolutionary new methods, coupled with better computational approaches, really set the stage for a new group of researchers like Adam Filippi, who you'll hear from, to finally generate a truly complete sequence of initially a female human genome in 2022, and then we got a Y chromosome last year as well. And the pioneers of that include people like Adam, but also Karen Mika, who you'll be hearing from also later in this colloquium. So that's the epilogue. We finally have sequenced from telomere to telomere uh, the human genome of every, um, of every human chromosome. So if I had to leave you with some take-home messages from this story, um, you know, the Genome Project didn't need 15 years, it only needed 13. We did map it, and then we sequenced the human genome. We did use the Sanger DNA sequencing to get us across the finish line. Since then, other methods have come on board, but we got across the finish line with Sanger sequencing. Sequencing the human genome was really hard because of all the complexities and all the repeats, but we figured out how to do it. Uh, Venter and Solera thought they had a shortcut. They tried to build a business around it. Didn't work. Um, and at the end of the day, we, um, uh, the Genome Project did generate an essentially complete sequence of the human genome, but then it took 20 more years to get everybody together with new technologies, new ideas, new computational methods, and finally develop truly complete telomere to telomere sequences of, of each and every um, human chromosome. So, I sometimes like to point out when I tell the story of the Human Genome Project that it is right up there with other incredible accomplishments in, in technology and science, and I would put the moonshot right there. Um, again, this goes back further in history. You know, I was uh, less than 10 years old. I was in my first decade of life uh, during the Apollo moonshot. Um, it was a big deal. It was typical of space exploration, involved a lot of uh, money and a lot of people and being highly managed, about a $25 billion effort. And it put a person on the moon. That was its signature goal. And that signature goal has been repeated 11 times. And I firmly believe, and I'm biased, but I'm also right, that the Human Genome Project deserves to be right up there on the highlight, same highlight reel as the moonshot. Um, it basically is biology's equivalent of the moonshot. Um, it really was biology's first attempt at doing a large managed project. It cost a lot less than, than putting a person on the moon uh, at $3 billion uh, total for the whole project, which $1 billion was actually sequencing the human genome. But I would also point out that our signature goal of, of actually sequencing a human genome, we've repeated it now over a million times, as you're going to hear from future speakers. So that's pretty incredible that we went from barely being able to do it 21 years ago to now having done it over probably multiple million times at this point. And I think that's a really important thing to think about, um, especially in relation to some of the greatest accomplishments uh, that humans have ever done. Um, I wanna make sure that those who are watching this know how they can learn more. And there's so much more you can learn about the Human Genome Project. Our institute has a major uh, presence of, 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 of explaining lots of things um, about the Human Genome Project. This would be a good landing page of a fact sheet that would then immediately bring you to a series of other things that you can get to and that we're constantly adding to. 
And so, uh, which includes videos and lots of other fact sheets and timelines and, and, and relevant publications, so on and so forth. So a good landing page, if you want to learn more about the Human Genome Project, is this uh, one, genome.gov backslash HGP. Um, uh, the, uh, the lectures in this colloquium are asked to maybe pick a few papers that you might think, obviously, there's hundreds of papers you could read about the Human Genome Project. So I just thought about what might be fun to make available and to point out to you. So I, I would recommend three, but I actually picked them at different time intervals. Um, I wrote a, a, for a medical textbook called The Metabolic and Molecular Basis of Inherited Disease back in 2001. So, so you know, most of the way through, but not all the way through the Human Genome Project, um, a chapter um, called The Human Genome Project and its Impact on the Study of Human Disease, which if you were interested, you should take a look at because it's basically explaining mostly to physicians what is this about genomics and what is it about the genome project that might be possible in the future? And of course, this was written now 23 years ago, so I would regard it as a historic chapter, but I might encourage you to look at that if you want to see what the thinking was uh, back in 2001. I also wrote a piece uh, with my good friend Aravinda Chakravarti, uh, uh, basically a commentary of what it meant to be at, in 2001 with that draft sequence of the human genome before we took it to the finished final sequence. So this was when that draft sequence got announced. And I, the metaphor we used was that we had just gotten to the base camp of a climbing expedition and that we were ready to do the final ascent to get to the top of the mountain as we would finish the sequence. But just taking the view from the base camp and what we had learned and what we were gonna learn going forward is a nice perspective. Again, it's a historic piece written now 23 years ago, but I read it recently and it actually is, it reminded me of lots of things I had forgotten about. And lastly, over the years, I've been asked to write various uh, comments and commentaries and perspectives. And here is one I wrote uh, with the, my two predecessors as director of NHGRI. So I wrote it along with Jim Watson and Francis Collins, uh, this comment that talks about 25 years of big biology. In other words, what's, what are sort of the legacies of the Human Genome Project? And I mentioned a couple of them, like data sharing um, and, and, and so forth, but we describe a bunch of them in this comment. And in fact, this comment piece was used to create a video. So there's also three videos I'd recommend. One is this video, which basically is Lessons of the Human Genome Project, was a video version of that comment that I co-wrote with Jim Watson and Francis Collins. I think a second YouTube video that I might recommend is that we recently had um, a reunion of the key leaders that got the Human Genome Project across the finish line in terms of the key leaders that were involved in running the big centers that, that uh, generated the sequence of the human genome as part of the Human Genome Project. And so we did a, a Zoom reunion of these people. And that's a long um, YouTube video, but it really describes in a lot of details, especially the drama and the story of the race with Solaire, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another uh, 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 video I'd recommend. And lastly, I recommend this video if you've not seen it, um, but it actually is it's just a video of me comment, a little bit of commentary and saying that's immediately outside my office here in that I think one of the hardest things people have when you explain the human genome to them is the scale. What is 3 billion letters like? And that's really hard to envision. And so this video um, depicts a tour of what one one thousandth of the human genome looks like because I have on the wall leading down the hallway outside my office here at NIH um, a wallpaper that physically depicts real sequence of the human genome, one one thousandth of it. So with that, I would strongly encourage you taking a look at, it's like a four minute video that I think you'd really enjoy. Um, and uh, with that, I guess I'd say, this is not the end of anything. Um, it's you know just the end of one journey. That's what the Genome Project was. And as, as commemorated on this um, stamp from the UK, it really is the, the just the end of the beginning. And um, another very prominent cartoon that came out about the time of the Human Genome Project's completion was this one, where they, you know, one person, they, they was excited because they finally had a corner piece of the three billion pieces of the human genome. But, you know, the Human Genome Project just determined the sequence of most of those three billion letters, but the next phase was going to all be about interpreting that information encoded in the sequence, um, something that will still take decades to complete. And I think so much about the colloquium that's going to follow is in the spirit of we're now on a new journey 
uh, that was started by completing the Human Genome Project and this excitement about interpreting the sequence and using that information for understanding how the human genome works and using that information to improve the practice of medicine is really what this symposium or this colloquium is all about. And as you will see as it unfolds um, in the coming months. And so um, with that, I am ready for the last set of Q&A. So questions. Hi, Eric. This is Kristen Lewis. Hi, Kristen. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, what changed from the draft to the final version? Like, what made you decide that the draft was good enough to be called the draft, and what still needed to be done to finalize it? Yeah. Um, so that's a great question. Um, the the I, I won't. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but um, the, there were really two things to keep in mind. Um, the draft was littered with lots of gaps. It, it, there was very, everywhere you were, there were just, it was, sometimes you'd have segments of DNA sequence that were ordered, but there were gaps of unknown size. And then there were lots and lots of regions within the sequence where it was, that we knew that, that they weren't good enough quality, that we weren't confident about. It. And so there is a whole art form that, that, it doesn't even get talked about as much anymore. A little bit gets talked about, but of something called sequence finishing. And um, the, the analogy, which I always like to make, is you know, like whenever you're writing a paper, think about when you're in college, you write a term paper, you get that drafts, you get that draft of the term paper, and it has all the ideas, but it, you know, it, it, it has a couple transitions that still need to be written, and then there's typos that you gotta miss, and and maybe some things you gotta rearrange a little because it's off. And 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 that's sometimes like that's half the effort to get the draft, but Hardcore polishing of text is really hard. The same was true for sequencing, because first you get a draft was really mostly robotic and automated, but finishing literally required really skilled technicians to get on computers and they'd go base by base, segment by segment, and there are all these tools to tell them where where is a segment that has a gap, where is a segment where the statistics don't believe the base, and they'd have to go in, and then they would come up, they would design experiments that have to go and they. They'd go back to the lab and like amplify segments and redo them or use different chemistries or use different other different little things. So it was customized. It was incredibly expensive. It was the very reason why Solera didn't want to do it. But what it got eventually was a sequence that was, I think it was the 99.99% accurate. For any base that was in the sequence produced by the Human Genome Project, you could believe that base. Now, there were still some gaps, and that's why, that's why there were only 92% of the, the sequence was done. But there was no way people were going to be happy with the draft sequence. It was good enough for doing, you know, generally doing some work and giving some clues, but there are lots of places you couldn't trust. Um, Susan, I see your hand up. Maybe you see sign of the Q&A. I actually had a question. Um, so I was hoping you could share a little bit about the bioinformatics, computer science, and programming ecosystem that was going along at the same time, because obviously they had to keep up with the science in order to be able to work together. Yeah, well, that's a, it's, a, it's a great question. And of course, so much of bioinformatics and computational sciences were growing up in parallel with the Genome Project. But, but later in the course, I, mean, I could think of someone like um, you, know, you know someone like uh, you and Bernie who will be lecturing in the course, or people like David Hausler who oversaw the develop and Jim Ken who oversaw the development of the um, of the browser that's the most commonly used browser for looking at the human genome nowadays. You know, some of these people weren't even there at the beginning of the Genome Project because as the Genome Project went along, it became clearer and clearer we needed the best of the best of some of these computer scientists. So we, we you know, people like David Hausler and. They got brought in, not at the beginning, but sort of near near the end, almost in a, an emergency 911 situation. So there's there's absolutely no question that as the Genome Project um, evolved, the internet got better and better, computational tools got better and better, but we also appreciated that, wow, we really needed um, a major part of our workforce had to be really strong computational and bioinformatics scientists. I see someone in the room with the, or a room with a hand up. Hi, uh, Dr. Yeah. Green, I have a Hi. question. Sure. Um, I wanted to know the strategy that you used for deciding 
um, when to use the whole genome method versus the cloning method. As you said, you use them both together to finish um, the final, more final copy. Yeah, so I, that's a great question. And I realized I might have uh, glossed over that. Um, at a very, what was, what was very clear um, that is that, that it was not going to be possible to, um, at least at that time, truly generate an accurate human genome sequence by a whole genome shotgun strategy. It was just too much. However, it, there, was, there was incredible value of having that data um, available. And, the, and the, the subtlety here is when you take DNA and you ask it to be cloned first into a big fragment of DNA and then sequenced, sometimes you end up with segments of DNA that are not happy being cloned. And the whole shotgun genome sequencing bypasses that cloning step and so delivers data that may otherwise not be um, readily available. And so what Solera did contribute to the Genome Project's effort was the recognition that it didn't have to be all clone by clone, that actually mixing together the data was actually sort of the optimal way to have it done. And so think about it, that you'd have all these clone by clone sequences, and then if you layered on top of that, the whole genome sequence, and sometimes help stitch together the clone by clone sequences or help refine bad paragraphs in one of those pages. And so again, it was all, at the end of the day, it was the mixing that, that turned out to be very helpful. I hope that was clear. But you know, it didn't become apparent until we had available these whole genome shotgun <clears throat> data sets. Susan, your hand's still up. Happy. I'm sorry, we have a question from the Q&A. Um, okay. It's Afi, from Afia, sorry. Um, Dr. Green, do you think that the genomics field would look different today if Solera, quote, won the race and achieved their goal of patenting genes? Um, I, I do. I mean, so so it, it's one is, well, patenting genes is one thing. I think the other thing that, you know, eventually the Supreme Court stepped in and said, you can't patent genes. So they, Supreme Court appropriately saved us from the absurdity of patenting human genes. However, the thing I was more, we, my, I and everybody in the Genome Project, everybody in the scientific community was so concerned about is this idea of selling subscriptions to access the, the fundamental human blueprint. If Solera would have succeeded in privatizing the human genome, access to the human genome sequence, I, I would contend um, a lot of really bad things would have happened. And first of all, I don't think we'd have nearly as much progress as um, as we have had now because of genomics, and uh, and it, because we uh, there would have been an incredible um, barrier of being able to access uh, being able to access it for many 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 people who would have had to pay subscriptions. I I, I also think it would have set an awful awful precedent um, of of not sharing and and basically making scientific data a commodity in a fashion that runs against the altruistic nature of biomedical research. So I, I, I you know, that's the stuff that, 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 that scary movies are made out of as far as I'm concerned, because I, I, I look at all the progress we've made in 21 years and how much we've changed the culture of biomedical research. And it's all about um, not privatizing things. By the way, it's not that I'm against the private sector. I mean, in fact, the, I'd immediately pivot and point out that when you hear Tim Doheny talk about these incredible new technologies for sequencing DNA that have come about since the end of the Human Genome Project, it's because these incredible companies came in and developed these technologies, in many cases, taking advantage of, of academic researchers that the government funded to make discoveries and then licensing their discoveries and the patents and blah, blah, blah. That's a beautiful example of the private and the public sector working together. And you know, yes, you have to pay to buy sequencing instruments, and yes, you have to pay to buy sequencing reagents. But to me, that's 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 a fair marketplace. But the idea of of commoditizing information about the fundamental human blueprint is 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 rather distasteful to me, and others. And any, we have five more minutes. Any last questions? While people are thinking of last questions, I will put in the shameless um, acknowledgement that NHGRI loves to stay in touch with people. 
So, uh, and that includes people who may be watching this video in the future. Um, lots of ways to stay connected to us. There's a, a website at the top that immediately shows you a nice landing page that'll tell you lots of different things that you can get to um, at the Institute that we'd love to share with people. If you're interested in connecting with me, I have a monthly uh, newsletter uh, that my staff and I work on uh, to put out to keep people informed about what's going on in genetics and genomics and at NHGRI. So if you want an extra email a month, sign up for that. If you're into social media, I am I have an active presence on three platforms shown here, including most recently Instagram, which uh, uh, people tell me makes me cool, but I don't know if that's true or not. I just know people told me that when I went on Instagram. So please uh, follow me if you're interested in that. And I'm looking to see, are there any other last questions? Are there any in the q and i I've only seen the chat. Oh, here's the Q&A. Not seen any, okay. Well, in that case, um, what I would say is uh, thanks for joining. Um, it's wonderful to have you and, um, you know, your future talks will happen and um, I, I look forward to them as much as I hope you do as well. So with that, uh, we will draw this to an end. Thank you very much.